Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Sine, um, and uh, I'm from UJ, and there's a, I had the whole pre speech prepared, and uh, I wanted to talk a bit about integration of technology and education, and my um, speech was, I started to think about how I can talk about it, uh, you know, from a, from a research point of view, but um, it being December and me realizing it's the last day of a conference, I uh, decided maybe not do that. So I've got slides full of pictures and uh, I'll just uh, share some of my thoughts with you uh, this morning. Okay, let's see if this works. There we go. Oh, this is me. I thought it was there. Right. So I'm going to talk about uh, the use of technology in the classroom. Uh, just some of the ideas that um, I would like to share with you. The um, chairman talked about integration. And I'm, a, I'm an engineer, but I work on IT projects. I work on uh, rural development projects. Uh, uh, we work in uh, some medical things. So integration is really something that's dear to my heart. I think we can apply technology um, in lots of interesting places to, to make a big difference. So I would like to find out, does anybody know what the this building is. Don't let the UJ logo in the bottom fool you. It's just part of the slide deck. So this is North Campus of Nelson Mandela University. Uh, it's in Port Elizabeth. That's where I grew up. And um, I was about this small when I started roaming the halls of this university where my father was. And I remember the, f I don't know where I need to point this thing there. I remember the first time I saw a lecture hall. I mean, if you were a student ever, this is familiar to you. And I thought it's just the biggest place I've ever seen. And my sister and myself, we called it the church. And we, we, we told our dad while he was working and we were roaming the halls, we found the church. I mean, it was similar to this. It's the, it's the, the church was the only other big building I've ever seen with so many seats. And he laughed. He said, no, it's in one lecture hall or something like that. I can still remember. I don't think I was more than seven years old, but it made such an impact on me. And then when I was a little bit older, uh, the next thing I saw there at um, Nelson Mandela University was a computer lab. Like, this is new. The computers didn't look like that back in the 90s, but I thought... It was just the most amazing thing, you know, in the 90s, it was an um, IT department and they had um, computer labs. And I just thought that is like magic. You know, it's this big place with hundreds of pieces, probably wasn't hundreds, but it made such an impact on me, on, on the stuff that was at a university. And then I went through school and I then went to this place. Um, I don't know if you know where this is, um, Northwest University. Um, that's the pretty building. I could not find a picture of the engineering building. It's not so pretty. Clearly, they don't want to photograph the engineering building. They photograph this nice white law building. But I went there, and I studied engineering, and I saw more labs. Firstly, in first year, you do your chemistry and your physics, and we had to wear lab coats in the chemistry labs and we got to play with electronics in electronics labs there were motor like big motor labs and i just thought this place is astonishing and um, they've got stuff and you learn all of these different things in these labs and i just thought that it's fascinating um and through my i think i was read in academia and through my experience at Northwest as well, I knew that I wouldn't really leave academia anytime soon. Uh, it happened after my studies and um, I came to the CSR. This was a poster a few years ago about the 75 year CSR celebration thing. And um, why? I don't know where I need to point. I was actually on the poster. So I did work here. Uh, a while back, uh, you would be able to see me. I did work here. Um, so, and 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 then when I worked here, it was a little bit different. Obviously, you're not training anymore; you are working. But I was just overwhelmed with the use of technology again because everything you do is you utilize technology to make stuff better. Um, these people just just used words and terms and stuff to enhance 
the work that they were doing. Um, and I really thought that that was just absolutely amazing. And I fell in love with the fact that you can use technology to do stuff better. And uh, academia called me back home and I went to this place uh, in 2016. And that's the University of Johannesburg. And um, that's where I am today. So when I was a student, I kind of just got you know, a taste of what it was like in an engineering faculty. But when I was at UJET staff, I, you know, interacted with all kinds of different departments and I saw different stuff. This is, a, for example, a bio, biochemistry lab where there is microscopes and I don't know what not analyzers and they analyze our oxygen for us and all kinds of these two technical labs and I didn't even have know all the pictures this is emergency services and our DFC labs there's like a real mini type hospital situation going on there I think medical schools even have larger equivalents of this uh, this is a photonics and laser lab that we have there at UJ where there's lasers um, and these things are just so incredible to me that the stuff exists and we train people on it. So I got overwhelmed with all of these types of labs and things. And, um, you know, I really fell in love with the equipment side and the doing side and the practical side of teaching. So, um, yeah, so this is my one thing that I realized is that we need labs to teach. As, a, as an academic, um, you need to be able to put students in a situation where they can actually, you know, see how it looks to a certain extent in the real world. We need relevant, and I'm putting relevant in there because I think all universities, um, you know, a lab can get quite outdated. We need to keep up with, with whatever's happening outside of the university walls, but we need relevant labs. Um, in order to do quality teaching. The second thing that I've realized is a student learns with his hands, all right? A student cannot simply learn by sitting and listening. Um, active learning really, really includes a large practical side. I'm in engineering, so um, I feel it uh, quite you know, often where you know, when a student actually starts to do something he understands what we taught him in the classroom. And I think even for IT and information science and sciences and, and those type of things, you know, you, you have to practice your craft. So we, we, we need hands-on experiences. If you are training to be a medical practitioner or a paramedic or a nurse or whatever, if, if, if you're required to do physical stuff out there, we need to teach you to do it in the classroom. Otherwise, you won't be prepared for what's going on outside of the walls. And the third thing that I've realized is that we need space for this stuff. Um, you know, these universities, I remember, they look massive. And the amount of students they, they house don't really equate to the number of square meterage of a university. And that's because of labs and um, these places where we teach students, um, you know, to, to work with their hands. And also we need to expand. We can't have the same labs facilities that we had 20 years ago because the world is moving at an incredible pace and we need to kind of keep up. So that is why we also need, I mean, I'm talking about physical space here. Um, places where we can rebuild and expand uh, teaching facilities. Um, but then I also got hit with reality when I started working and I realized there's a whole lot of other stuff coming with the management of a university. Um, labs are incredibly expensive. Labs are expensive to build, labs are expensive to maintain, and labs are incredibly expensive to upgrade. It's nice to get a once-off sponsor from a corporate to build a lab two, three, four years down the line. These things need to be maintained, these things need to be upgraded, and it's it's incredibly costly. And you can probably go into any university lab, somewhere in the corner there's a dusty something that hasn't been working for a while. Um, it, it, it happens because uh, maintenance and upgrading of, of these uh, facilities and equipment is just extremely costly. The second thing that I've realized is, 
laser pointing again. Um, sometimes the real environment is just really, really, really hard to find. If you have a group of 100 civil engineering students, they need to go on site somewhere, sometimes. They need to see what they're going to do in the real world. When you have 100 medical students, they need to get into a hospital or a caretaking facility because they're going to need to get experience of what it's like out there in the real world. And sometimes it's difficult to facilitate. I mean, I work with electrical engineers. We used to take students to ESCOM power distribution plants, power generation. ESCOM doesn't take students now. They don't have time to show students around the site. They've got their own problems. So it, it becomes really, really difficult sometimes to get students um, the real world practical experience that they need. Um, third problem that we face is that universities do not have enough space. Um, there are thousands and th hundreds and thousands of people who are applying to universities every year and not even a tenth gets placed. There's a stat about Wits Medical School where about they receive about 14,000 applications every year. They take 220. I mean, it's staggering. It's just, it, it's just a staggering amount of students applying with so, you know, to, to compete with such a small number of spaces, seats, places where we can train these students because we can't take more and not facilitate proper training. So we, we do not have enough space to facilitate all our students. Um, and, the, and the fourth one that we're all too familiar with and I don't want to get into is um, COVID then came and and made things even more difficult because um, now they forced us to go and have a look at um, how can we not train students while they're sitting here? We need to now go and uh, do online training and teaching. And to a certain extent, I think for academics who are quite slow sometimes to adopt new teaching methods, um, this was a very nice nudge to get them to at least do some online teaching online training, um, online tutorials. And I think to a certain extent, there were some positives that came out of it, but we really, really, really seen in academia that there's a lot of online stuff that didn't really work too well. And one of the things is you can only go so far to give a student, uh, uh, you know, a, a real life experience. Um, you, you can't teach a student how a motor works only in simulation. You can kind of give them an idea of how something may work or how to set it up, but you, you really cannot get to that real life situation. There's a whole lot of other problems, but uh, I think that's the one I want to talk and, and talk about today is what we've realized is that you can't really move everything on to, 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 to real, real life. Okay. And um, I, I quoted this guy and he said that necessity is the mother of invention. And I like it so much because um, we need at the universities, we need amount of stuff. There's certain things I mentioned earlier, and, and that's really a necessity for the tertiary education space. And then I found another quote of, uh, I think, a guy that's even smarter than Plato, maybe, and he said, if necessity is the mother of invention, then frustration is the father of creativity. And if there's two things that an academic is at a, at a university is um, there's a great need for certain things, and they are incredibly frustrated um, sometimes with 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 the resources that they have. And um, I quoted myself, I couldn't find anybody else, but I'll put my name on it. Online teaching is not the answer. Okay, I couldn't find anybody important to say it. I'm willing to put my name next to it. We can't just do online teaching and think we're solving space problems, capacity problems, experience problems, financial problems. Um, I put the picture there purposefully of a guy with dirty hands because I think really we need to get our hands dirty in learning. A student needs to practice the stuff he's going to see out there in order to make him ready um, after he's graduated. So um, what I want to now just show you is um, some examples of how technology can be used in teaching. And I want to make a point that 
technology or virtual learning is not equal to online learning. Online learning in the most basic sense is me doing a Teams call and throwing slides at you on an online call, but we shouldn't stop there thinking that that's the only way to use technology in teaching. So I wanna just show a few examples of really interesting and innovative things that was born out of frustration that's born out of necessity from, um, from academics and what they have come up with to solve some of these problems that we face at a university. Um, the first, oh, why am I struggling? The first one, this is um, the Department of Mining and Mine Surveying at UJ and they built a virtual mine tunnel uh, in one of the basements. And the, the lines here, or this is a real tunnel, so this, this part, but this is a projection. It's a projection of a, of a blast wall. And if you are a mine, mine surveyor, you need to be able to blast through this wall to further on your tunnel. I don't know what the technical terms are. We can't all take 100 students and blast a wall for an exam. It's impossible. We can't even take these students always down into a proper mine shaft uh, or a mine tunnel. So what they've done is they've got this very... Oh, goodness me, this very nifty projection line. And what a student does is in VR, it's got VR goggles on, and he can actually now go blasting virtually uh, so that they can teach the students on how to go about blasting through mine tunnels. Uh, another thing that they do at mining is there's a drill drill rig, hydraulic drill um, rig simulator. So if you need to drill into a wall, the real panel that's on the rig is actually there, right? They've replicated the real rig. You can see it there at the bottom corner. But what the students see is actually how you would go about drilling. So it's just type of mixed reality where you still have a physical presence. Students still feel certain things. Um, they feel the right knobs and whatever. This thing, if you do something wrong, it actually, I don't know, it, there's some um, haptic feedback, so you actually vibrate and you, if you do something wrong, you can get kind of shocked in a sense, where, where you get some feedback on what you are doing. What we're doing at electrical engineering is um, when we talk about maintenance and setting up devices, type of process control, where you have this really interesting, you have a, a app on your tablet where you can actually now see um, you scan a device and uh, it shows you the, the connections that's already made. You can draw up the maintenance schedule of certain co components. You understand what it does. You can pick up the, the data sheet of those things. So that's really cool in a sense where, where you have labs, but in a way, it's just a little bit smarter. Another thing that's being done is this is zoology. So now to prepare students for their practicals, they must do a pre-prac where they dissect the frog virtually. Uh, then the corner is a student with the VR goggles. So it, it doesn't replace it, but it's a good precursor for them to then um, practice doing this first before they go on to dissect real, uh, real frogs. There's a chemistry simulation. This is actually from the Department of Education. Um, so the Department of Education at UJ are busy with um, how can you do basic science experiments or basic chemistry experiments um, with your VR goggles on uh, so that you can get a feel for what you need to do so that when you actually do your experiments, it's not something really strange in you. Um, there's gaming applications in mining. All the students have an app. This stuff gives you fire drills at three in the morning and the students must stand up and do something on their PC. And then at three, four o'clock again, there's something that needs to be done. Um, so it's really just an experience of how, how hard it is when you're actually on the job and all the stuff that needs to be done. So there's an app and this thing wakes up the students and they need to do assignments in the middle of the night um, because that is the experience that they will have in real, in real mining um, environments. Another thing that we're working on is this is one of our labs in our department is to do multi-purpose facilities where you where, where you repurpose a space for purpose. So all these labs I've shown you previously, most of the time they stand empty. Yes, we need them because we need to train the students, but most of the time they stand empty because we only use them in practical sessions. So what we want to do is we want to try and see, um, we want to, it, 
we want to try and see it's not up and running yet. Can we use space smarter? So can you have one type of testing or practical facility one day and the next day you can change it to something else? So we want to make it as hybrid and multi-purpose as possible because we have a space constraint. Can we be clever about the way in which we use space? Otherwise, we take a whole facility, we set up a control lab or a machines lab, and um, that is what it is. You can't really repurpose that space. Um, sorry, my examples are all kind of engineering, but that's the world I'm from. But I think it's applicable to to you know to other worlds as well. So these are the interesting things that um, that is being done. One, I think it's one last one that I want to show you is um, there's a simulation library at UJ. So this is emergency services where you can see it's like a setup hospital. This is not a photo. This is a scan. So it's like a 3D game, you can do it on your PC or you can actually put on VR goggles, you can walk through, there's certain safety things that you can do in a pre-practical, you do your equipment checks, so there's maybe certain equipment checks that needs to be done, uh, there's certain charts that needs to be completed, and you do all of that virtually. So when you do your practical with your with your test, I want to say test dummies, test patients, that's still real. But at least when a student now walks into that facility, he knows exactly how it looks. He knows where everything is. And he's kind of done the pre, pre stuff already. So it's just in a way to try and see if you can get um, students to be more comfortable in the real spaces and uh, maybe to do some of the more uh, routine stuff um, in, a, in a virtual space. And the last one that I want to show you of, of ideas that's being developed is, um, you know, the whole idea of metaverse, you get virtual classes, you get virtual labs, where it's not just you doing a simulation. I should have put in a picture where there's other people as well, but you actually interact with other people and um, you can actually talk to them, you can actually collaborate in a lab space doing some, some basic experiments. And the last thing that I think is so important from a, from a university education point of view is um, the, 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 the experiences and the support from industry. I, I want to use the, the example of the cybersecurity challenge that ran here yesterday and Wednesday, because that is the purpose of that challenge. That challenge was created in order to get students um, interested in cybersecurity and it's hands on. It's not a talk about cybersecurity. They sit for two days and do it. And that's the best way that we can get students to understand and to learn about these experiences. So th there's so much interesting stuff that's happening. And I've used huge examples just because it's the place I come from. But if you go and have a look at how technology is being used at Wits Business School, oh, Wits um, Medical School, it's astonishing. And I mean, they, they do realize that you can never take a doctor away from real hospitals, but the way in which they can prepare a student so much better for the real world by using technology is staggering. UP has got a whole engineering for our building with stuff. So there's a whole lot of stuff and, and creativity and innovation coming, coming out of universities in order to assist us with teaching, which is, which is, which is really quite, quite interesting. Um, so I, I think this is just my last thought is um, I don't think we will ever be, we, we cannot be fully online, right? But technologies, technologies will never be able to take us fully online. I think if, 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 we, if we want to, if we want to um, be good, good teachers and good lecturers and, and good graduates at the end of the day. But I do think that it allows us just to reimagine on how space can be used and what is possible with the space that we have. Because expansion and, and money doesn't come our way maybe very easily, but um, we must just reimagine the way that we use the stuff. And I think technology is an astonishing enabler um, for that type of things. So yeah, that's me. Um, thank you so much. Oh, do I get it? Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Questions? Do you have any questions or comments? First, you, sir.
and then Jeremy, and then Mary. Uh, Prof, for a good presentation, very enlightening, very inspiring too. But I just have a follow up question on the uh, simulation laboratories that you showed. It's a very uh, reality picture, but then uh, how does the student get to understand the parts around it? Because I see like there are some oxygen pipes, there are some lab equipment, but how would they know that what is this and what like so that they can know the environment properly as you said thank you uh, thanks i i only had a print screen i you can actually navigate through it so that was my thought to do it but it, it got a bit, little bit difficult um look i'm not an emergency medical person by any stretch of the imagination but as far as i understand it there's um it's a it's a that is just shown as a type of familiarization so you can walk around and you can see everything but on top of that now they wrote they explain it to me like a game so you you're a person and you're in the game and you've got certain things that you need to do for example check the oxygen levels or switch on and look at the status of this monitor and do a check take out a checklist so then you have like a clipboard with a checklist and you need to do certain things um i'm i'm pretty sure that you might as far as i understand i did it once you know there's a information button that you can click and it would give you some information maybe on an oxygen sensor so it's really really interactive it's it's really like a game if you see something and you're not sure what it is you can kind of click a, a eye or an information type setup so it's really they go through like pre safety checks there's a clipboard and you need to check you can't just assume the i don't know the thing is working you must go and check and do some physical checks so that's the idea so it really works like a game uh if you know what is what i know there's like an information button um but uh hopefully a student doing that stuff will also maybe know some of the basics but i think it's the idea is that it's really really interactive and that you are run through those things um with with instruction I don't think we'll ever take away instruction instructors. Um, those will always be there. Right. Thanks, Prof. Thanks, Jeremy. Uh, thanks very much, Prof. Jeremy Main from the South African Radio Astronomy Observatory. Thank you for the presentation. Um, I'm very interested in the, uh, the COVID slide you showed. Um, COVID amplified many of our challenges, uh, but also showed us some opportunities in terms of um, uh, opportunities to pivot and, and opportunities to really question what was essential. Has there been sort of any follow-up to look at what what was what was improved by by COVID in in the teaching and pedagogical space? Thanks. I think I remember when I started at UJ, we were starting to think about how can we do certain, you know, if, if it's a pure theoretical talk and students sit in front of you, they might as well, you know, watch a, a video or something like that. And we dragged on for, I think about five years on, on how to do it and what technology to use. And um, then COVID hit and we were forced. And I think, I think we uh, explored so many interesting things uh, and so many wonderful open source technology that you can, that's it, that, that exists. I think what we've, we look i don't think we'll ever go back pre covid i don't think i think we've we've adopted so many things that we'll never let go so for example um uj i can only speak for uj but we've got a policy of um first years 80% contact second years 70 and it goes up to 50% contact in fourth year ah uh, 50% contact in fourth year simply because there's certain things that we realize you can do online um, you can do basic theoretical maybe teaching online. You can ask students to conduct uh, certain assignments and things online. You can ask them to do something when they're not really in front of you because what they are doing is essentially not um, maybe something practical or something that they might need help with. So I think we will never be able to go back. I think we're, we're, we're smarter cause of, cause of, cause of, 
be smarter in teaching because of what we've learned of COVID. Um, I've got uh, really, I don't, I, I, I'm not a, opposed to online teaching at all. I just don't think it's the one solution and the only solution, but I think we've learned a lot. And I think the fact that we were forced into it maybe saved us in a sense because academics move slow. You know, if you've taught in front of a class for 20 years, that's the way you want to do it and nobody can tell you to change. And um, this forced us all to reinvent the way that we're teaching. And like you say, to rethink about what's, what is necessary. Uh, we'll never go back to pre-COVID teaching. Um, I don't think so. Thanks, Prof. Uh, Melvin. Hi, thank you very much. My name is Mervyn. Uh, I have a question. I know that the 4IR technologies are quite invasive. Uh, how do you deal with the question of ethics and privacy? Uh, was there any policy that, that needed to be developed before you started to implement those technologies in your teaching and academic uh, projects? Thank you. Oh, well, um, yeah, I think... Uh, Definitely. What what we what I think what we try to do is we try and handle all of these things as um, close to us as possible. I, I really do think that um, you know when we use these things, there's a lot of I don't want to use training uh, awareness and um, those type of things that goes along with it. We uh, I know UJ is extremely. Uh, strict on how how students interact with technology and how that stuff is being used. Um, I think maybe we got away with a lot during COVID because we were forced to. Um, so I think there's still a lot to be done with regards to how these how these things are handled. Um, maybe they're clever in other departments. I think for engineering, we are now suddenly dealing with data that we've never had. And we really don't know how to manage all of that. So I think that's really a, a conversation to have as to how to go forward with all of this. Um, because there's so many different things now that we need to manage, which is new. Um, so I think that's that's actually a very good comment. I think that's something to, it's, it's a conversation that we're having and I don't think we know all how to tackle that in a sense. Thank you, uh, we still have time. Can I also take I'm in front of you. questions? Okay. I'll have Renier and then you, sir, and uh, the guy at the back. Renier? When you mentioned that the lab stands empty the most time, I, I realized, do you think there might be opportunity for universities to share? Because you now can do it virtually and federate the, federate the share the facilities. If one is a, a specialized mine, Thank you. That's an amazing question. And we've been having that conversation in engineering education where there's like a South African engineering education group. Um, it's um, it's uh, it started by a lecturer from UP actually, but it was just to start a conversation on how do we educate engineers better and that's the conversation that we're having we've got specialized maybe equipment in one area and another institution has got something else that's specialized and we're starting to see how we can use these facilities um, all of us because essentially we want to improve the whole um, space or the whole profession and in sharing these facilities or these um like you say, these specialized facilities is really the way to go. We've only seen that, and we've got two engineering departments uh, on two different campuses where the labs look different. And what we've realized is while we only teaching our students in the one set of labs, there's another set of labs, uh, like you say, it's sometimes not used, it's part of a different department, but you can use, you can take your students there and they can come here. So we're starting with that conversation. Um, and we've, we, we, we're starting with, I think undergraduate teaching is a little bit more difficult because you now have a hundred students to move, but in postgrad for sure. Uh, I think that's one thing that, we, that we're starting to see. I think it's, it's another thing, it's out of necessity. You need to start sharing. I think also that I can see a change in academics as well. Um, a, a few years back, we were really, no, I'm not sharing. It's my, 
IP and I'm not sharing my stuff with anybody else where now it's really just we need to share and we need to improve the profession or education as a whole. Um, so it's, it's a much more of an open, I think, conversation now uh, where we can actually start talking about sharing facilities for sure. Hi, Prof. Thank you so much for your lovely presentation. Um, I just had a question uh, related to the conundrum you had about space and specifically about the limit on the number of students that could attend universities. I was just wondering if you could maybe elaborate further on how some of these solutions are able to reach a greater number of students. Um, because you presented uh, quite a few technologies related around VR technology, but of course, for a student that is not able to access a VR headset, yeah. um, I'm just wondering how those technologies can reach those students. Yeah, thank you. That's one thing that we've also seen during COVID is students, you, you, can't, you can't even assume a student has a computer at home, right? Some students did two years of engineering on their phones. All right. So that's really also something that you must always keep in mind is sometimes a student doesn't have a PC at home. Um, sometimes a student doesn't even have electricity at home. So one of the things that um, was really interesting is those um, uh, the VR things. Uh, it's some of them are really clever where they built it for a headset, but also for a phone. And uh, I didn't have a picture, I should have added it where, you know, those cardboard, it's like a cardboard goggle with an insert for a phone. Some of those applications work with that. And we've had quite, quite a lot of fun with like uh, open days for schools, where you take those goggles and they put their phone in there and they can run a simple app or a simulation. So that's, I think that is maybe one of the ones that are really, um, you know, that can really reach a, a larger, you know, extent of students. Uh, some of the other ideas are simply to, to get a, a larger bunch of students through a practical quicker, because if you, if you are running in efficient practicals, you are kind of clogging your labs. So as to, if you can get like those pre-practicals and, and pre-checks and those type of things done in bulk virtually, you can run students quicker through practicals, then you can accommodate more students. So if you are able to use your facilities more, efficient, more efficiently, you can actually expand your capacity of students. Uh, that it's both as a standard. Um, is am I, am I understanding you? So, do I see a future where these two things are standard, both? Yeah. yeah. I, I think you say we're not going back to that. I can see. I think this is a future online, especially for those courses which don't necessarily need uh, these protections. Yep. At least from by the United States, and the law makes it go, and almost like I believe you, Jay, when your dad told it, that's what my daddy was. Now, what's the problem? Yeah. Uh, so that's the way to sustain those. Uh, yeah. yeah, thanks. <laughs> So what we've seen and what we what we started to talk about is obviously there are certain um, programs 
um, that you know that 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 lends itself nicely towards online teaching and learning. But there's also some modules that lends itself nicely towards on uh, online teaching. Maths um, is, is one example where it's it's a it's something that you must practice. You listen, you practice. It's not a there's no practicals related to certain maths. If you do, um, you know, your statistics and those basic courses and us uh, at engineering having a baseline in your maths and your sciences, there's many courses that lends itself really nicely to being online full time. So what we are actually talking, um, what we've been talking about and what we've been thinking is how can you do, how can you in increase your intake maybe in first year? Because what we've also seen is, for example, we in our department can take 100 students, you take up 100 first years you lose 20 by the end of the year now effectively you've lost 20 percent of your capacity but you can't really take in second years um, you're running with 80 further on get smaller and smaller as you go so can you maybe take in a larger capacity of first years when you actually just do your basic maths and sciences and um, you are going to lose students we lose about 20 percent maybe students in the first year anyways then when you lose those, you are still at capacity. So you, you do your first year maybe a lot more virtual, you take in more students, you don't need really more space for them because the modules actually lend itself nicely towards online learning. They can maybe come in for a practical every now and then, but they don't have to fill up a class really. That's something we've talked about. Um, what we've seen is putting first years 100% online, maybe it's not the best idea because they need to sit, they need to see how a university operates. But I think um, definitely, I think peer theory classes, we've all sat in classes where the lecturer anyway just speaks. Uh, I, think, I think we must just be clever about how we integrate it, if it's modules, if it's courses, if it's tutorials. Um, but definitely, I don't think we'll ever will ever not do some type of hybrid situation, for sure. Did I take another round of questions? I also have a question for you, Prof. Sir? Oh, so. There we go. Better. OK, so yes, I'm a mechanical engineer recently. I'm still in Bosch University, which is where I also studied. So I've kind of got a very narrow view from that point of view. One of the things I've noticed with practicals, and I'm I think that what you are proposing to do with regards to practicals is, and what some of the things that you guys are developing are wonderful and it can really change things and I'm looking at doing some things using new technology like 3D printing and stuff as well but what, what concerns me slightly is that in my experience of practicals as an undergrad and I've seen the same thing happen to students that I've tried to help if the practical has involves a lot of pre-setup which the students don't do what generally happens is they become passive observers at best and they don't learn out of it. And when they finally have to do their own projects, they have no idea yeah. how to set up an experiment. It's actually, in many ways, a bit of a waste. And what I have, if you are not adding yet more layers onto this, you can exacerbate the problem. Yeah. <sighs> yes. I, I, look, this is not at all figured out. I think all of the stuff that I've mentioned is in trial. It's been used for the first time now. We are exploring. I think we're exploring as we, we're going along. I think one thing that we've seen is when a student steps into like a practical, you're a mechanical engineer, so maybe you use um, a big type of equipment, something, if they've at least seen it before, right? And they've at least, you know, um, seen where the knobs go and so on. At least it's not something brand new, them stepping into, into the real facility. But we haven't got it figured out. And that's, the ma that's a massive problem we have. You, you know, especially if you've got big equipment, you don't have a hundred sets, you've got 10 students working groups or they alternate. And then there's obviously always students that just um, stands and looks at what, what other people does. Uh, that, that's not solved. That's not solved yet. I, I, I agree with you. I think um, we're still exploring how to solve all of this stuff and make it a little bit more efficient. I have some ideas I should perhaps talk to you. Awesome. After. Actually, mine is maybe similar to his as well. I wanted to hear the other side as well because you have been hearing what I would call the push side. But on the pull side, I, the students receiving this well, how is the performance in terms of results? For example, 
2002 and they were all everything was online. Mm. If you take those results in terms of pass and compare, yeah. how does it look? I don't want to talk results really because I think the I am not sure that we we could really um, assess at the same standard. Um, we we from my perspective, we cut certain practicals. It became simulations. We cut certain builds. It became drawings. Um, on paper, it was better. On paper, students perform better in 20, 2020 and twenty twenty one than they are performing this year, but. I think it's in a sense the the practical sound talking engineering. I think it was just a little bit easier. You can see now the fourth year students that we have, the paperwork is brilliant. The simulations work, the drawings are there, but when they need to build, they're struggling. Um, so I think um, that's one thing. What we've seen is students are actually asking for online. They're asking for technology. I think they are much more... Um, used to using technology. They don't want a textbook, they want it E, right? They don't, they're not highlighting a book anymore. So I think they are much more susceptible and excited about using technology where I think it's maybe us that's not. Mm -hmm. um, so they are quite interested in, in, in doing things that way for sure. But marks, I don't wanna comment, maybe it was slightly higher, but I think we kind of assessed it differently. Um, I'm talking engineering now. Any other questions? So I have, I have just two questions. Maybe I should ask the one because I'm. I think the other one might not be relevant. But in the disruption of OIR, <laughs> where you had this abstraction abstraction of software away from hardware. And now I say that in, as a practitioner. So, you know, we don't we no longer go into a data center to sit behind a console and configure. Yep. You're sitting by your desk with a screen. Right? So, that abstraction has kind of been very significant for the practitioner. But yet, when you present, you are saying we still need to touch the equipment. And my question is that if 4IR has created that disruption at a practitioner level, how are you preparing the student for that eventuality when they get to the workplace? They actually fact not if they choose a particular career, they're not going to see the whole. They're actually always going to see a software. Yeah. How do you get that kind of a thinking that a software driven? I I think it's there, right? And I, I think it's I think that's the that's the idea. I want to push them to understand the hardware simply because as an engineer, you need to design these systems. If you operate it, it's fine. If you design it or you maintain it or you upgrade it, you need to understand. Somebody needs to touch that thing sometime. And most of the time it's an engineer or a technician. You need to understand that if you, we've got this whole debate about, yeah, but you are training engineers, you're not training a technician. He doesn't know how to, he doesn't need to know how to wire a plug or, or you know, how, how the wiring works. And I totally disagree with that because how can you design something if you don't know how it looks? We've got students that, that abstraction is there. They just want to program something, but they don't understand, for example, if you've got a high current flowing through a cable, it needs to be a large cable. It doesn't, can't just be a small wire. They need to understand the physical stuff. Sometimes that thing that you're programming through a screen is going to break and somebody needs to look at that motor. That's the guys I'm training. Um, yeah, they, I understand, but I, I actually think the movement in education is exactly what you say. I think by default, it's that, you know, you, you kind of, you call it abstraction, you, you kind of, you know, screen from that because you're programming and you're, manage, you're managing and you're upgrading through a screen where the guys most of the time or some of the, some of the guys I'm training must actually go and install, build, design that thing. Um, that most of us are looking through a screen. They need to understand that stuff. But not everybody. Some. We, ne we need to understand what we're programming, I think. Um, yeah. Okay. I think, thank you very much. Let's hold it there. Let's give it Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you.